Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining me for another exciting podcast. Uh, glad you're here. My name is Ramon Ray, founder and publisher of zoneofgenius.com. You can get to know me better at ramonray.com, but definitely check out zoneofgenius.com to help you live life fulfilled. And here today, we talk to another entrepreneur, business owner, rabble rouser, and that's Blake Hutchinson. Uh, and so, Blake, uh, glad you're here. And I put an N in your name. It's actually ba Blake Hutchison. <laughs> so Blake of Flippa, glad you're here today. And I hope you and your family are well. How are you, Blake? Yeah, good. Thank you, Ramon. Thank you so much for having me. And uh yes, that's a that's a that's an old habit. People put an N in the in the name there, but um don't worry too much about that. Thank you for having me on the show. You're welcome. And I concur with you. You know, I'm called Raymond 70% of the time. And then some people add a Y and a D to my name, you know, the first part of the name. Some people add a, an, an accent like Ramon. And I get it. You know, we all, you know, like I just did, right? But I'm like, it's okay. <laughs> so, yeah, the name thing is a funny thing. So I'm yeah. I'm Blake. But if you yeah. say that, um, if you say that with a thick Australian accent, yeah. um, I will get everything from Wayne to Blair to Dwayne. Um, and my wife, her name is Flor. And uh, of ah, course, yes. have no idea how to roll the R. Yeah very familiar to Americans, but um, when she's ordering a coffee, she tends to use my name. And when I'm ordering a cop, when I'm ordering a coffee, I just use John. I, <laughs> I keep it simple, right? But listen, Blake, so glad you're with us today. Blake, why don't you give us a overview of who you are today? Who are you? Tell us a little bit about your world, uh, per, as personal as you want to get, and then about Flippa. We'll, we'll just, so people understand today, who's Blake and what you do, who you serve. Yeah, so my world is, uh, you know, being a, a busy CEO while trying to be the best father and husband I can be. Um, I live in Australia. Um, what that means for me is that I'm I'm far away from a lot of my peers and colleagues who are distributed throughout the world. And that can make things super uh, challenging, but at the same time, very, very interesting um, and, and intellectually stimulating, actually, because people come from different worlds and different perspectives. So I spend my days starting early and spend my um, nights hanging out with my wife and daughter, trying to be the best I can be, but um, still still challenging uh, the day-to-day -day status quo as much as I can. Absolutely. And so Blake, let's talk about uh, your, uh, I'm curious, I got this from a friend of mine, Glenn Lundy the, of a Breakfast with the Champions. Do you have a morning routine? When you wake up, is there anything in particular, do I heard two different things? One executive said, yeah, my morning routine is a cup of coffee in the New York Times or something. I was like, okay. The other routine was like, no, I zen first. So I'm curious, what's your morning routine if you have one, Blake? <laughs> yeah, so I must admit, I'm trying to get better okay. at a healthy morning yeah. routine. Uh, right now, my morning routine would be starting probably 5.45 a.m. or 6 a.m. And, and straight into email and Slack just to see if anything's happened overnight. Sure. And so, you know, you wake up with a little bit of anxiety. That's not yes. necessarily a healthy thing to admit, but you wake up with a little bit of anxiety wondering, mm -hmm. you know, how did the business do over the overnight? Because in Australia, um, we build our product from here, but most of our right. sales and revenue comes out of other markets. So that's, that's how I start. The second thing I'll tend to do is, is just have a little chat to my wife, right? She's she's literally to my left-hand yeah. side. <laughs> and so you say good morning and how is your sleep and did you have a dream? And um, what were you reading before you went to bed last night? And all those types of things. Um, after that, it's run up the stairs as fast as you can uh, to get get uh, my daughter Isabella out of bed uh, and see how she's doing. And so we we tend to play some music. So it it's such a diverse um, diverse array of music that will play her in the morning. Everything from bit of Elvis, bit of Snoop Dogg, bit of Rolling Stones. She's only two and a half. Yeah. Uh, and occasionally she says, Daddy, ACDC. So we play a little bit of ACDC. Whatever she's feeling like in the morning to have a bit of a jump yeah. around and a bit of a dance and make sure she has a smile and a laugh before we go downstairs for breakfast. I love that. I love that. I love that, Blake. And I'm curious, my children are adult children, you know, uh, 28 and 24. So a little different journey, but I've been there. What are you thinking of, Blake? And when I say, what are you thinking? As you advise others, always when I ask, it's, you know, advise others. Your daughter's a small, you know, barely out of being a baby right now. But as she gets four and six, what are you thinking of running a fast growing company? You want to be profitable, make money, change the world. You have your own team to support, your own yeah. challenges, your own mindset issues. And you have your family that you've been blessed with. Just curious, what do you think about now? What do you hope the future looks like? And what can we learn? Because you're in a perfect stage of having a, a child, a young family. 
and you're and you have your other baby. Let's face it. I, I'm there with you. I've started five companies, and my wife has said, Ramon, some days I think I'm living with another woman talking about my current ventures. So yeah. tell us how you do that, Blake. What's that look like for you and Flippa and your actual family? <laughs> yeah, it's super difficult, isn't it? I you know, again, I, I think I'm trying to be better at this. Yes. So I, I would say I, I suffer from a little bit of mild anxiety around the performance of, of the business. Sure. That comes from a want to give my family everything I think they deserve, right? Yeah. So um, that's an awkward balancing act because it can sometimes appear like you're being selfish because you're trying to do what the business needs. But to some extent, what you're trying to do is actually provide for yourself so you can provide for others by building a, a good quality business that we can all live and breathe off the back of. Right. Um, so that makes it challenging. What I tend to think about is um, when you're in work mode, be the best possible worker you can. And so be the father to the role, be the father to your team um, and uh, spend as much time delegating, spend as much time empowering, try to spend as much time coaching expect a lot from your team because if you don't expect a lot from your team you're going to have to do it all yourself and that's not possible or practical or probable so if you can get yourself into a point where you've got an outstanding team like i do that should then mean that when you're spending time as a husband and a father you're dedicating your entire time to them and so what I will try to do is, is that. So, you know, speaking about the morning routine, I get an absolute kick out of making my wife her morning coffee, Man. you know, proper machine, get it out there, get the beans going. Uh, wow. Stamp no instant coffee in the... <laughs> uh, don't do that. Don't do that. I'm a bit snobby about my coffee. And then similar with my uh, daughter, she's two and a half and she wants a baby Chino, right? Which is just the froth. Um so froth with a little bit of, um, I don't use chocolate for obvious sure. reasons, but I just, there's a little bit of Milo, which is like an energy drink. Sure, sure. And I just sprinkle that on top. And those little moments enable you to find balance because you're giggling with them and sharing the moment with them. Um, I wouldn't say, you know, I've mastered it all. My daughter will absolutely catch me on my phone. Um, and that little sweet tone goes from that to something a little more aggressive yes but you know i think we're as as global citizens these days um what i try to do as well is is figure out what other people are doing you've asked me that question i ask my staff all the time you know um what's your routine like what who handles pickups um and you just you know you're just trying to figure it out <laughs> yes yes you know, Blake, I think what you said, I would just today as we're talking, I had a meeting with my team was also distributed. And I'll, I'll shout her out. Her name is Helen. She's assistant editor of Zone of Genius and other members of my team, but in particular Helen. And we had one of those vigorous discussions, not an argument at all, but I was pushing back, pushing back against something that that I still am not, I think I'm, I may be right about, but she was so forceful, so on, on point to your point about hiring good people. When you have good people, the business does grow. So I want to underline to that to those listening, you know, that makes business work. There's enough problems in the marketplace. We can't help yeah. that. The, the economy, elections, politics, sicknesses, we can't help that. But if you have a team that's sucky, that makes it all worse. But you have a baller team, a great team, Blake, I think you're so right, that enables us as leaders to build, to vision, depending on if you're integrator or visionary, you know, like Gina Wickman says, you know, but enables us to build our businesses. And again, our tagline, live life fulfilled. So I really think that's powerful because I find that, and I've, I'm not perfect in this, you know, I have a much smaller team than you do, but when you hire people that are not performing well, they're not thinking with you, then you kind of have to baby them. And I think we want our kids to grow up you know, that's kind of a metaphor there and immature and operate on their own. I think our business team has to as well. Does that make sense, Blake, uh, what I'm trying to yeah, say? That makes a lot of sense. I, I I empathize. I appreciate that commentary. You know, we, we for a while there, we were hiring generalists, right? Sure. Because we needed lots of work complete. Uh, and our general thinking was get someone really smart, diverse array of experience. And that was really good for a certain stage of our business. And now where we're... Uh, orientating to specific strategies which we believe grow our business you 
are more likely to have success with specialists. Yes. Someone who has done that for multiple years. It's not to suggest you can't learn the skill. Of course you can. You can learn anything. That's not the point. But if we're trying to guarantee our success, you want to go with people who have done it, been there and done that before. And that's the next phase of the flipper journey that we're on right now. By doing that, it should mean that we can actually zero in on the things that matter to us as a business. And again, I can pull myself out because I don't have those skills. And I can go back to being a better father or dad and not having to work so many hours. So that that balancing act is something that I um, challenge myself with day to day. Sure. And what about your own team, uh, um, Blake? And again, we're talking with Blake, a founder, I believe, of Flippa. Uh, Flippa is an amazing marketplace to help people um, buy and sell content or mainly websites. I think it could be more than websites. Is it websites or is it more than that as well, uh, Blake? Yeah, websites, websites, stores, apps, online businesses, okay. digital assets that people have built and built and run. Creator economy. Love it, love it, love it. So definitely check out Flippa as well. Um, Blake, I'm curious, what do you tell your team? Um, as you want to live a life fulfilled, as you say, you want to grow and 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 do better and and be on the beach for three days, no apology. You know, that's what I tell my team. Great, as long as stuff is done. How do you declare that to your team? Or how does your leaders even declare that to their team members? Do the people at Flippa, are they, um, yeah, let me just ask the question. Just how, how do you telegraph that to your team? Or maybe you don't, maybe it's a new thing and maybe, yeah. you know, there's no time, but talk about that. So, you know, it's probably easier with a globally distributed team, right? Because to some extent, if I disappear for a day, nobody actually knows. Right. Um, now you're also accessible. So if something actually goes wrong, you know, Slack, phone, yeah. email, whatever it's not that hard to actually find out what you need to find out pretty quickly these days right what i have tried to do most recently and actually recommendation of the flipper chairman who said look why don't you take the first two days off of every new quarter mm. and the idea being that you know you've run so hard for three months uh you've you've achieved as much as you possibly can take the time to step back and refresh and, you know, I've recently taken up golf and that's been really great for my mental health. And he said, you know, take those two days. Sure, your your daughter, your, your wife might not be able to take it off with you every time. But in that case, it's actually time for myself. And so as a CEO and as a husband and father, um, and I'm not trying to sound precious about this, but you actually rarely have time for yourself. Yes, yes. And so one of the things that I've tried to communicate to the team is that from time to time, I will actually um, turn off, zone yeah. out, yeah. Um, and be by myself for X number of days. Now, I must admit, I've never never been able to do that for more than two days. Um, and the it's next a start, that's a start. <laughs> a start. And the next uh, the next piece of that is um, is related to actually being able to take an extended holiday. Yes, and tune out and turn off and of course the business will continue to be great without Best me i'm not so sure. smug as it, it wouldn't be but it's a um it's a challenge taking that next yes. step yes and yes. so what you have to do is almost take yourself on that journey as much as you take others yes so what i do when i'm telegraphing that to the team is i will literally say um it's been hard work i'm probably going too fast i'm doing too much i'm going to step back for one or two days and you'll see me shortly and you know what? No one cares. They're like, sure, go off. It's not yeah. like they beg you to stay around. Yes, yes. And But I mean, and isn't that how once you build a business that can operate by itself and do it, isn't that what building a business is? I mean, it feels a little bit, I get it. You know, they don't need me. But if you're building your business properly, like many of the leaders whose famous names are around us, Musk or Bezos, whoever you want to pick, you know, the day, that ideally should happen. And I think even as as companies grow, my my vision for my own company, Zone of Genius, you know, a lot smaller, I hope that one day people don't even know my name. I'll be a little sad, but hopefully one day they're just doing what they do. And I think I got that from, I mentioned uh, a keep, you know, Clay Mask said that about when companies grow, the, the picnic, when you're first there, you know, everybody, everybody does do. Then you go there, you know, most people and everybody knows you. You go again, you know what I mean? It's something like, you don't know most people and nobody knows you. You're like, yeah. there we go. So uh, I think the I think the basics of this are so um, interesting and yeah. I often forget them myself, right? So if I hadn't been exercising, 
So yeah. I went for a really long run on a hot Melbourne day on the weekend. And the energy you get from that exhaustion is quite is quite incredible. The endorphins, the um, you feel more lucid, uh, eating well, right? Uh, sleeping when you should be sleeping, um, turning off your device an hour at least before bed, so you've got that that moment to to calibrate before you you zone out for you know six seven eight hours whatever your journey looks like. Um, those types of things, spending time with your friends and family where they're distracting you mm. from work, it's amazing because not only is it so good for you, but you come back and you're so much better at the job. And sometimes those basics are forgotten by myself and, and so many others. Sure. And uh, and I'm trying to get better at that. It's a, what, what is the routine that makes you the best you can be? Mm. And I think we're all trying to discover that. I, I'd love to know what your routine was, Ramon, to be the best you can be. That'd be yeah. We should reverse this interview. Yeah. Anytime, anytime. I'll give you the mic. There you go. But um, but I think, yeah, for me, routine, the morning routine, at least, and I'm not sure if it's the perfect one, but I get this from a mutual friend that I'll tell you about his journey in a minute. But um, basically, I, I have my devotions. I happen to be a Christian, so Bible reading and prayer is important to me. Uh, I do push-ups, stretches, uh, exercise. I'm not a jogger, but I do yeah. try to be fit. I eat usually some fruit, an apple, orange, yeah. uh, nuts yeah. or something like that, a cup of coffee, Cafe Bustello or some strong coffee. That's generally speaking my wake up routine that takes me about 30 minutes, give or take. I wake yeah. up at 425 and then I'm quite involved with it. I may have shared with you before an online community called Breakfast with Champions. That starts at, yeah, that starts at 5 a.m. Eastern time. And so there's a whole team involved, but that's pretty much my morning routine, my devotion, stretches, eating. Um, and then I definitely try to get in a 30 to an hour power walk, maybe not every day, but most days, but some exercise I do. And then beyond that, Blake, the kind of journey you're on, we're doing different things as it were, but you already get, you know, I have a small team and just leading that team. So that's pretty much and looking at the metrics, the speeds, the feeds. But I, but also I must say, this is part of our business, interviewing amazing leaders, but I love this the most, Blake. This is yeah, this brilliant. is what I love doing. It's Is it business? Yes, but it's it's kind of like you hosting a mastermind with some of your clients or something, right? It's It's business, but you enjoy it. You want to sit down and help them thrive. You can't yeah. get better than that. So that's yeah, these are these are the best bits for me for sure. I mean, I get energy from 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 others. I'm not the type of person that that can sit in a room by myself and churn away at a keyboard. It's just not the way I'm wired. Yeah. So I, you know, I love being in the office and collaborating, getting the whiteboard out and saying, well, you know, what are we trying? What are the problems we're trying to solve, and what do our customers want us to solve for them? Yeah. I enjoy these types of interviews, and you kind of you're you're in a better state of mind yes. when you get energy from others, at least for me. So that, that's a key part of the routine. The other thing, Ramon, which which um, I must admit, it's probably only been a, a year-long routine for me is walking one-on-ones, right? Yeah. So um, it's so easy to say, let's, gr let's grab a room or let's jump on Zoom. Yeah. That's nowhere near as good as walking the streets and just having a conversation okay. without, without your laptop yeah. and, and talking about um, life, um, observing what you see and commenting on it. And of course, getting through the cool work stuff. But yeah. walking one-on-ones has been a gem for me. I love that. Walking one-on-ones. And you get to know the person better, I think, over time when you're walking. It's just different. Uh, Blake, I do want to turn the page, but if anything I didn't ask you about this, feel free. But let's dive into Flippa, if you don't mind. Talk a bit about who it's for. I'm um, sure I assume there's a few different types of buckets, you know, the billion dollar sales versus the dollar sales, whatever. But take the time and help us understand who it's for, what problem you're solving Help us understand all that, please. So we see ourselves as the investment bank for the 99%. So think about all of those business owners all over the world that have built great businesses and ultimately want to sell. We are a marketplace to buy and sell online businesses. They could be sites, they could be stores, they could be apps. They, in theory, could be YouTube channels and podcasts. They are assets. Yes. And most business owners don't recognize that. They wake up each day, um, and they do what is required to ensure that it gives them the return they expect out of it. But most people don't see them as assets. Interestingly, on the buy side of the marketplace, that's exactly how they are perceived. They are perceived as assets. Much like owning a home, you can own an online business. Much like a rental property has yield, an online business has yield. Unlike crypto, it's less speculative because you get to see cash coming in. You can assess that over the last three years. You can then predict and forecast and budget for what will happen over the next year or more. 
So the marketplace is set up as a trading platform. Think about Airbnb. Mm -hmm. You can list your home and rent that home. Think about Flipper. You can list your business and buy that business. And so all over the world, people are doing that because the platform economy, the creator economy, has stimulated and built a new small business economy. Okay. And so as I say to my teams, you know, when you walk past an apartment building today and there's a cafe at the bottom, look up because there's probably 10, 20, in some cases, depending on the building size, hundreds of small businesses operating. They could be bloggers talking about health and wellness. They could be podcasters doing exactly what you and I are doing right now. They could be an e-commerce business selling candles. Each one of those business owners is on a journey. There's a point in time where they should and they want to exit. Mm. So Flipper democratizes the exit. I love it. Is there any um, top level secrets that you can reveal to us? Uh, and I know being a marketplace it's a marketplace, right? But anything that you can tell, say the person who's um, like, I don't know, if, I don't know what's easier. Should I make up a scenario? Like if I have a podcast with 50,000 listeners, any tips for me if I'm just starting out? How can I be a future flip a seller? I don't even know what I'm asking, but give me a scenario. Yeah, no, that's okay. okay. So, so the, the thing that people need to understand is that uh, buyers are not looking to acquire something that hasn't, um, that doesn't have predictability, right? Okay. They're looking to ensure their investment. So okay. they want an ROI and they want consistency of performance. The only way you get consistency of performance is, is through um, uh, age. So length of business operation. Um, and so, we, you know, we call that business maturity. So the average business that sells on Flipper is actually four and a half years old. Okay. okay. So when people start a business, they should think about, can I imagine running this for two years, three years, four years? Okay. Because to get an exit... Um, a buyer will look for that. Okay. The next thing is that typically, while a buyer absolutely is looking for opportunity, they pay for your performance, okay? So what does that mean? That means that if I'm doing $100,000 net profit, that's how your business is assessed. Got it. And so the average business owner says, yeah, but you could do this and you could do this and you could do this and you could do this. That must be worth something. They're your ideas, Someone doesn't pay you for those ideas because someone has to take responsibility for executing against those ideas and that will tend to cost money. And which is why they're probably buying it. Meaning if that was the key, you could have done it. So Correct. Blake, thank you for the ideas, but I'm buying it because I'm going to do what you just said. You didn't do it. Kind yep. of. Yes, you didn't do it, Sorry. but I will pay you for what you did do. And what you did do was $100,000 net profit. So critical thing, buyers will pay for performance, not for opportunity. They appreciate opportunity, but they sure. won't pay you for opportunity. And then probably the last thing is that consistency mm. is actually better than hyper growth because when you're selling something valued between $100,000 and let's say $10 million, it doesn't have unicorn written all over it. Right, right. It's not a hyper growth business. And so hyper growth um, can be a red flag mm. in, in online business sales where we're talking about, again, $100,000 up to $10 million, you tend to be looking at consistency of performance. So what business owners should, should figure out is how do you actually diversify your revenue streams and add as much into the business operations as possible to ensure that where one side of your business may not perform this particular month, the other one can prop it up. And so that consistency of performance is really important for people. If you can handle those three things, there are so many great buyers globally, um, individuals, high net worths, um, private companies, family offices, private equity, who are all looking to buy these digital assets and for different reasons. In some cases, they buy to operate. In some cases, they buy because they're aggregating against a portfolio strategy. And so it is important for a business owner to actually say, Ramon, why do you want my business? What are you going to do with it? And so that you can then understand how to tell that story and position yourself for exit as well. I love it. Is it fair to say, Blake, that many of the people buying are pretty smart? And I say this because my my crafty mind, possibly why hockey stick is not good. Blake said he's buying my business. He's thinking about it. I just do a bunch of Facebook ads or whatever, jack it up and say, see, see, see. Is that I'm just guessing that's one kind of reason, maybe in that business, why hockey stick, something's wrong here. It was it was one for 10 years and then it went to a thousand. Yeah. Is that 
kind of they yeah. are savvy, right? They are really savvy. And and what we <laughs> find is it's a little bit like the real estate market. Yeah. So you'll have a first time buyer who's on our platform and they're like, Ramon, your podcast business is incredible. Tell me all about it. And you'll have a savvy buyer who comes in and says, Ramon, your podcast business is incredible. I've just submitted a letter of intent, right? So what you've got to understand is that there is a sophistication of buyer on the platform that sometimes trumps the large number of first timers. Now that's unfortunate for the first timers, but it's kind of equivalent to any asset right. class. Right. <laughs> Fortune favors the brave and those who have got the expertise and the money will tend to go a bit quicker. So they're smart, they're savvy, they're fast, they're, um, they're sophisticated in their negotiation tactics. So they will try to do things like, and for all the right reasons, they'll want seller financing where they can actually pay less upfront and more over time. They might think about an earn out on bigger deals. They might say, look, $10 million deal, I'll give you seven and a half million upfront and two and a half million dollars on a stability payment in the event of a performance at 90% of the prior 12 months revenue, something like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's important to know that um, <laughs> it's we can control the match. Yes. We don't know how, how well the date went. Yes, I got you. I love it. I love it. And I'm curious as well, talk about then what Flippa's role is. I'm, I'm assuming maybe there's a bit of escrow, maybe not. Beyond yes. that, help us understand marketplace. What does that mean? Why is it important? Why is it? And I'm sure it's fine. I can just call Blake directly, buy something. But what's the yes. value add of Flippa? Help us understand that. You may have said already, but underline that. What's the value add of? Yeah, I guess there's three things. So the first one is unparalleled buyer reach. We have the largest buyer pool globally. So unless you are extraordinarily well networked, um, it's highly unlikely that you could tap into a relevant buyer um, with the click of a finger like Flipper can. And so unparalleled buyer reach. The second thing is the technology that underpins that. So we have uh, predictive valuations based on 13 years of sales data. Uh, we have the data integrations coming out of Shopify and Stripe and Magento and QuickBooks Online and Xero and Google Analytics. So we can actually, without you doing anything, we can essentially populate a prospectus or information memorandum with the data that you provide access to. Okay, so um, you asked, that's a benefit, meaning if I'm selling confidentially or whatever the, you know, however it is, I, I want to do that because as a marketplace, I trust Flippa. I didn't know this, I trust Flippa. And that means the buyer can say, great, Flippa said, they're based on a million because Flippa looked into their data or whatever. So am I on the right track? Yeah. Is that the idea? That's absolutely right. So okay. I would connect I would connect to Shopify. Flippa would pull down the data. We would expose that data, obviously on an opt-in basis. Um, and the buyer would then use that data to inform their decision-making and of course, okay. validate the veracity of yep. the asset. I love it. Okay. The third piece is, forget about technology, is we have a team of advisors globally who will sit there and actually make sure that they are a conduit to the deal, helping you get a deal done. Got it. So we are a combination advisory plus technology meets marketplace. I love it. I love it. Can I put Flippa on your marketplace and call one of my billion dollar brand friends and, and have them buy Flippa? <laughs> in, in, in theory, you could for sure. Um, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not out of the question. <laughs> my mind racing with some things, but no, I love it. Blake, anything I didn't ask you, Blake, that you wanted to share either about uh, you know, content and buying and selling and monetization, feel free to talk more about that and or just being a great entrepreneur as you clearly are. Anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about? No, the only thing I would say is, um, you know, discovering the things that work for you um, mm -hmm. because I read so much about what works for others. And so discovering the things that work for you and you alone um, is the most important thing. Like it could sometimes feel extraordinarily overwhelming to take on all of these tips and tactics from others. And so just find that little thing that works for you. And, and I'm still discovering that myself. Listen, I'm doing the same thing, starting this new business. We're doing some Facebook ads and other things. And it's new for me. I'm stretching myself because the previous things I did, Blake, was more Ramon, Ramon centric, not in a bad way, but, you know, kind of, what do they say? You can succeed by a smile and pushing your way through, but it's not strategic. This time I'm listening to my team. I'm working on SEO. I'm pulling back. So it's, we're both learning, you know, both learning. So, sure, sure. but, but uh, Blake. Hutchison, I'm so glad you're here. A flippa. Thanks for being here. Blessings to your family. And I hope we do meet again. And everybody, my name is Ramon Ray, founder of zoneofgenius.com. Get to know us better at zoneofgenius.com for great interviews like this with amazing people like that. I'm trying to point to Blake. So <laughs> there it goes. Thank you all for joining us today. Blake, thanks for spending time with us. I appreciate you.